Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are here to talk about the new Osmus user dashboard. And we're going to show just a few quick slides to give you a little bit of background and get into a live demonstration. So I'm going to do that quick presentation. And then um, between Shana and Paula and I, we're going to do different parts of the live demonstration. And then Andrew is going to um, help us out with sort of fielding questions. Um, we are going to try to do questions at the end, um, but certainly put in anything that you have that you think of in the chat window. Um, Andrew will be watching that, and he's also our my login expert. So if you have questions regarding that, he can um, address those. And sorry for the um, pre-meeting chat. We were having to get used to using this software, and we were on doing some demo. So um, that was a little bit of freebie for you, um, but I think we got it and I think this is going to be smooth. So we're going to get started. I'm going to turn my webcam off while I'm presenting. I'll be right back on. And um, as Stephanie said, um, if you would like to click on the slideshow, that would make that um, bigger for you and a little bit easier to see. Just a little bit of background on this project. The Osmus User Dashboard is part of a bigger project called Case Management. And we started this project years ago, and it had some stops and starts along the way, but we really made some excellent progress in the last year to take a look at Osmus and change it from more of a reporting system into a true case management system. Some of the things that we were looking at is to modify the system to become more dynamic, more user-friendly for the case managers and MWA administrators to integrate that system with other existing data systems and try to get some more um, intuitive functions and less duplication. So we had a lean process improvement. Uh, we actually had one in the past, but we did have um, a few of these last year. We um, talked to several different people, um, our stakeholders, Michigan Works Agencies, partner programs, state policy. We had 10 days of lean process improvement events. And as you can see the um, information in the middle, they came up with a few issues with our system and that's okay. We really wanted to get into the heart of what was going on with our program. So over 150 issues were identified and more importantly, over 220 ideas of how we could change the system to become um, some of those things that I just talked about, you know, flexible, intuitive, dynamic. So with all of those ideas, those were um, actually morphed into formal recommendations. And the formal recommendations were approved by our executive leadership. So on the far left, you'll see those listed here. I know that's small. From there, we created implementation or what we call action teams. So there were four different action teams with individuals from the data and performance reporting section um, from um, the state of Michigan and then Michigan Works Agencies to work together to address all of those recommendations. And one of those was the dashboard. So Action Team 2 was assigned, um, the first assignment actually um, right out of the gate was to work on an Osmus user dashboard. So we created the dash team, and then as you can see that final area um, arrow is what you um, have today, which is the new Osmus user dashboard. So um, I do have to mention in particular, this um, dashboard action team was absolutely phenomenal. It is a way that I think we should um, use from now on. It was just a great partnership between our staff at the state of Michigan and three different Michigan Works agencies, Oakland County, Great Lakes Bay, Macomb St. Clair. So we had, um, George Wright, we had Melissa Kelko, we had um, Bernice Kerner, we had Lisa Strasky. So we had um, a really good team to get to the point um, of that we're at now. And then of course, on the far right, we had our um, programming and development team, and then the My Login team came in as well. And then we also had um, some assistance with um, more of the artistic side of the dashboard. So this was really a phenomenal team that brought everything together and really created this dashboard from scratch. 
What you have now is a multi-level customizable user dashboard, and it has a lot of those things that um, we talked about. Most importantly, we feel like it is truly a customer-centered dashboard that addresses all of the different roles. So if I'm a case manager from, let's say, Capital Area Michigan Works, my dashboard looks completely different than if I am an MWA administrator from Oakland County. So it is really, um, it fits your role and the information that you need as a user. Just as a reminder for anyone that um, is a user that there is a um, couple different uh, tools that you can use. We have an information guide, which to say it's an information guide is an understatement. Um, it's an 80 page plus guide that breaks down every part of the dashboard. So if you wanna know exactly what goes into a path terminated data count, you'll find it in that guide. So very detailed. Um, there's also a desk guide that gives you a snapshot of the four main areas of the dashboard. And so it's more of a visual um, tool that you may wanna have like a, on your desk. The information guide, as I mentioned, um, will provide detailed information on every part of OSMIS. So this particular example is the Business Resource Network Active Widget. It tells you exactly what data we're pulling, how to make it into that count, where in OSMIS we're pulling that from, what output you're getting, and what that output means. So a lot of detail there. Also, we, um, for the first time, and we're really excited about this, we have training recordings that cover this first release of the dashboard. So the dashboard went live in late August, and we've already started work on enhancements and changes and improvements. But we have three recordings right now that cover um, what the dashboard shows you, and um, you can find those in the Help Info tab on OSMIS. So there's a new link called Training Recordings. So now we're gonna go into talking about each of the different parts of the dashboard. Um, it is broken out into four different areas. So you see a black line on the top of the screen, that black line and above, we call that the header, and that has a couple different areas, including the global search and quick links. And then that middle section in gray, um, that's called widgets. And then the bottom area is tasks. So we're gonna talk about each one of these things um, in detail. Widgets are quick navigation to different areas in OSMIS. Global search is a very much enhanced way to search for customers. I think you'll be really impressed by this if you haven't seen this already. Widgets are mini data points or reports that are customized based on the user's role and that can be customized also depending on the preference of the user and what they wanna see on the dashboard. And then finally, we have um, both manual and automated tasks available on the dashboard. So really neat um, functions there. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Shana. She's gonna cover the first area of the dashboard. So like Tammy said, I'm gonna start going over some of the dashboard. And hopefully, yep, you guys can see my screen. So I'm just gonna take myself off of video while I go over everything. So um, starting with the quick links, up here in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see it says Osmus and there's a little down arrow. Um, those are the quick links that will take you to any of the different programs within Osmus. And then down at the bottom, you can go directly to reports, participant reports, or the system update notices. So it's a really quick way if you aren't super, um, you're not really familiar yet with the dashboard and you don't really wanna play around with it, you just wanna get into Osmus and do your work that you need to do, this is the quickest way to do that. So if we click Osmus front page, it's gonna open up a new tab which is nice so you can get back to the dashboard if you'd like. And it's gonna go straight into what should look like a really familiar page to everybody in Osmos. And of course, because we're all presenting today, my internet's going to move very slowly. <laughs> but this is the standard front page of Osmos. It should look pretty familiar to everybody. And you can jump right in and go to the places you need to go and not really mess around with the dashboard. 
So all of the programs and then some participant reports and the system update notice are all gonna fall under Quick Links. So really great, fast way to get into Osmos without having to play around with too much on the dashboard. Um, and then up here, this should look pretty familiar. Every web page has their own little search and navigation tool. So this is modeled after any website that you might be familiar with. You can type in what you're looking for. You can hit the magnifying glass or just enter to search. So really easy. And this is search results page. So I just wanna go over, there's so many things that you can search for here, which was what makes this tool so much different than the um, old Osmos search. This is really intuitive. There's a lot of different things you can search for. And in the information guide that Tammy mentioned earlier, it's gonna break down each and every way that you can search for a person in the global search. So I typed in test. Since I only typed in one word, this search function is going to recognize this as a last name. So it's gonna search for test as the last name. And you see, we've got a lot of them because we create a lot of random test accounts um, in our development system. So if I typed in test and then comma Bentley, it's going to recognize test as the last name, Bentley is the first name, and it's gonna search based on that. So over here on the left-hand side, these are your search results. And when we click on any of these search results, it brings up what we call the customer card. So this is detailed information about that customer. Um, at the top, you can see it's got their customer ID, date of birth, address, phone number, and then all of the programs for which this individual has had a registration, either a current registration or a closed or exited registration. So those are all gonna show up here, your active registrations are going to be at the top. So really nice, quick look at this customer's information. And then if you wanted to search for this person by their birth date or their phone number, that's available as well in the global search function. So um, this person has only had um, some WIO well registrations, but if I were to click on this little arrow here, that's going to take me directly to this customer's WIOA registration. So not only is this a really great quick look at this individual's information, I can go directly to their registration in Osmos. So it's a really great quick way to get sort of high level information on a customer and then go directly to their registration. So it's a really, we're really proud of this feature. It's really great. And it's so much more than what the old Osmos functionality was. So now I just wanna draw everybody's attention to this little symbol here. This is our advanced search feature. So when I typed in last name, test, first name, Bentley, it pre-filled that data into the advanced search, which is really nice because then you know you can build on the search that you already did without retyping everything out. So you can add on date of birth, you can add on their customer ID if you know that, their phone number, and that way if you're looking for somebody who has sort of a, a popular last name, if you're looking for a Smith or a Davis or something like that, you can drill it down with more detailed information and it'll still have your baseline where you started pre-filled. So that's really nice. And then if you wanted to search just within a specific program, you can do that as well. So it's gonna show everybody last name test, first name Bentley that has a Wagner Pizer registration. So that's a really nice part of the global search feature and it really helps to be really specific and find um, a specific um, customer that you're looking for. So a really great feature. And I also want to um, draw your attention to two more things. You'll notice at the top here, there is a disclaimer. This search does not include the holding file. That is a future enhancement that we're really excited to add on, um, but it's not a part of the global search feature at this time. So if you know that the person that you're looking for might be in the holding file, and they don't show up in your global search, you'll have to go into Osmos and do um, sort of the classic search that you would do um, for somebody who might be in the holding file. So just a disclaimer on that. And then I wanna highlight a really nice feature um, up here in your header, you'll notice this little clock symbol. If you click on that clock symbol, it'll show you the last 10 
searches that you completed with the global search, which is really nice. So if you know you forgot to put in a case note or forgot to do something with somebody you searched for this morning, you can go back and say, yep, there they are. I searched for them and it's going to bring up that person's card again. So you can go into the registration or get some quick info on them. If you need a phone number or an email address, you don't have to go back in and do a full search for that person. They're going to show up right here in your recently viewed area. So it's really, really nice. Um, this person does have an email address put in to their customer card. So you can click on that. It'll open up your email browser and then you can send that person an email directly. So that's a really nice feature too. This only works obviously if in their Osmus registration, you've entered in an email address for that person. But if you did, it'll open up whatever you use um, to send email, if you use Outlook, you use um, Yahoo, whatever is saved onto your computer as being the uh, current email. Oops, I lost. Well, I lost my second screen there with my demo, but Tammy, if you want to take over, I don't have anything else to show. Yeah, definitely. One thing I wanted to add with the global search that I think is a side benefit is that customer card that Shana talked about, and I'll bring one up too, because we're stealing that for widgets, and I'll show you that as part of the enhancements if we can get to that at the end. But that card will show you every, like if you have a participant and they have five different PATH registrations and 10 different Wagner Pizer registrations in the past, but they have an active TAA and an active WEO, it shows you all of that, which, we were struggling with widgets on how to show co-enrollment. So we're actually gonna show you the customer card from Global Search as an enhancement on the widget. But just to keep that in mind, if you're looking at wanting to see an entire history of a person, including co-enrollment, that Global Search is a perfect way to do that. So I thought that was really neat. We're stealing that from Global Search and putting it in widgets. Um, okay, so let me switch over to um, the widget demo. Sorry, it's a little bit slow here, but I think it's loading up. Okay, I think you guys can see it now. Sorry about that, it was um, just spinning. Okay, so I'm gonna spend the next few minutes talking about um, widgets in detail. So again, um, just in terms of what widgets are, they are many data points that represent that user's information. So um, widgets contain just that information and that information may require you to do something, but it is really just data. It is not like tasks that Paul is gonna talk about that actually requires action. If you have a task, then that means you need to do something. If you have data in a widget, that means it is good information for you to make decisions on, and you may or may not have to do something with that information. So um, for example, right now I'm showing this first widget here is the Business Resource Network Active Customer Base. I happen to be signed in right now um, as an MWA administrator. So this is good data for me to know that there's 87 people that are active in that program. Now I wouldn't need to do anything with that unless I knew there was over 200 and this number looked very wrong or, oh, we just got this number down to 10. This number doesn't look right. It is information that you need to use or you should have to make decisions, but not necessarily need to take action on that. So as I stated, widgets are customized based on your Osmus user role and all user roles in Osmus are mapped to three categories. You're either a case manager, an MWA administrator, or your estate policy or estate admin. So um, those three areas are, um, so if you're, let's say, um, in the veteran's services program, you're gonna be mapped to a case manager. Um, there is a case manager role in Osmus, you'd obviously be mapped to case manager. Um, there's several MWA administrator um, roles, you're gonna be mapped to that MWA administrator. So in terms of the counts and data, if you are a case manager, then you're only going to see data for which you are the official case manager for in Osmus. So an example of that 
would be here. I'm hoping this will, this, yes, it is showing you. So every program in Osmus has a case manager field. If this is blank, then that means there's no case manager and that this customer would not show up on your dashboard if you were a case manager. Regardless if a case manager is assigned or not, the MWA level is going to see everybody in their MWA, case manager or not. And when I show you um, a couple widgets, I think that'll be more clear. So in terms of um, having access to widgets and the widget output, which I'll show you, um, there's really two types of access. There's the ability to view a widget at all which um, the only role that is completely restricted is a role in Osmus called view only. So some DHHS um, staff have a view only, and I think there's a few different other view, oh, there's an MWA view only. They would not be able to see widgets at all because they've been deemed to not be able to, um, they only can view Osmus and so they don't have access to um, actual widgets. And then the other access is um, being able to click on a widget and get the data that comes from that widget. So here, if I click on this widget, I can see the list of the 87 customers that fit that widget. So you know, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can click on it if you have a plus sign next to it. So as you can see, some of these do not have plus signs. I'm going to switch over to a case manager dashboard. So this is a sample case manager dashboard. There's a plus sign on every single widget because we always try to prioritize case managers. So we gave them the most access and we're working on getting the MWA administrators and the state policy that additional access as well. But each one of these is a report that takes um, sometimes a few seconds or a few minutes to run. And so we couldn't um, give the MWA administrators all output access, but that is something we're working on right now. Um, in terms of su subscribing or unsubscribing to widgets, you do that here in this little setting box, or if you are first logging into your dashboard for the first time, it will say no widgets selected. And so you'll go in and you can customize your dashboard by clicking on any combination of widgets that you want. Now, it, you don't have to lock this in. You could be like, I, I oversee three programs, but I just, I don't want too much information today. I'm just going to be working on one program. So I'm going to deselect all of these widgets here because I just don't want that information. I just need to see one thing. So I'm working on business resource network, maybe for the day or for the morning, and then I'm done working on that. And maybe I just want to switch over and work on the TAA program because that's the other program that I work on. So I go over to that and it shows me the data um, there. So you can change this as much as you want. It doesn't affect anything. Um, now, again, if I'm an MWA administrator, so I'm going to go back to an administrator's dashboard. And if I truly oversee all programs, let's say I'm a program manager over all programs, I may want to keep every single one of these widgets open. Now, we do ask that you don't keep widgets open that you really don't need or will never use because each one of these takes time to load up. You see, when I go over to a different role, it does take a minute to load that dashboard up and our system has to produce all those and run those queries. So, you know, we just ask that you um, only put the information that you truly need on your dashboard. Um, in terms of how often is your data refreshed for widgets, um, a case manager's dashboard will update every 30 minutes. So if you're a case manager, again, we prioritized you as wanting to make this system work for you. And every 30 minutes, your dashboard will refresh. So let's say that, um, let me go over back to a case manager's dashboard and kind of show you what I mean here. So I have 33 people active in trade adjustment assistance. And I know that um, today is the, I'm providing services to someone and um, I'm gonna 
finish serve or I'm going to enter them into training. Let's say I'm going to um, enter a few of these people into training and I enter three people into training. This number in about a half an hour will change to 21. So the exit is a little bit different. So we'll talk about that here in a second. That was sort of a bad example. But if I were to make changes and add three people into training, it takes about a half an hour for that information to catch up. If I'm an MWA administrator, we were, we were able to get that to update about every two hours. So that is more scheduled. So starting at 6 a.m., it will update you know, 8 a.m., 10 a.m., noon, all the way until 6 p.m. So that will happen Monday through Saturday. Um, so it will take a little bit longer for your, um, your dashboard to refresh if, let's say, there's um, you know, a lot of changes that are happening, a lot of awesomeness data entry, then you are gonna um, see that at that next scheduled update. Okay, so that is um, most of the functionality. I have one more thing I wanna show you before I get into like what these actual widgets mean. Um, each widget, as we talked about, ha um, you may or may not have access to click on that widget and get the output. Most of the time you will be able to, and again, that plus sign will tell you if you can click on that. And um, what this is, we call this the widget output. So whatever information is here, you have 33 people active in the TAA program as of this moment. This is called the output screen, and it has um, as standard, each widget will have the name and the customer ID and the case manager and the MWA ID. And then depending on what the program and the type of widget is, it will have different types of information that is customized. So right now there's 17 widgets. Every widget has different output. So for example, with TAA, we have the certification number. Um, with a lot of the common measures programs, we have reg date, participation date. If we're looking at a training widget, so these are open training activities then you're going to have training information here. What is the type? When did it begin? Um, so each one is a little bit different. So just recognize that um, you're going to see a little bit different information. We did the best we could at fitting as much information as we could inside of the output without it being too overwhelming. But we're very open to feedback about that or really anything um, to do with the dashboard as we continue to work on the modifications. So I want to go back now and look at um, actually what the widgets are currently. So we kind of talked about the functionality, but I wanted to talk about what, what widgets we have available to you right now. So we have six different programs, um, program categories, I should say, and that matches the programs that we have here. So Business Resource Network, TAA, WIOA, this is Title I, Wagner, Pizer, and Welfare Reform. So Welfare reform, we did split that up between FA and T and PATH with WIOA. We did keep all of the WIOA programs together, um, just FYI there. Um, so let's look at the different um, types we have. So this is everything that is available today. And if we have time, we'll cover some enhancements and new widgets. But for Business Resource Network, we have active training instances and exited. So what that means is as of right now, this is how many people that are active in the program. Active in the program may be different for BRN than it is for let's say TAA or WIOA Title I. So that guide will tell you if you're wondering what it means to be active, you're definitely gonna wanna either watch the recording or look at the guide so that you're very familiar with what that means. So for example, with BRN, active means that you have um, a business resource network registration in OSMIS and you do not have a manual exit. With BRN, that's the only way to exit is manually. Now, the most important service that you can get in BRN is the BRN employment. You do not have to have the employment to make it in this query. So it's just something to keep in mind that it's good to always know what the definition of each one of these are. For training activities across the board, these are instances of training. So this number here 
could be higher than this number. And the reason is, is that this is a customer count. These are active customers, but this is instances of training. Same thing with all of the programs. So there's um, almost 4,000 people active in PATH, and there's 142 instances of training. But it could be higher because you could have one person be active in two different types of training, which I don't know if that's, you know, logical um, very often, but when we were doing our testing and building all of this, the DASH team decided that that was the best way to go because truly you do want to get credit for two training programs if someone truly is in two different types of training. And then finally, we have a category, we call it exited slash terminated. So depending on the program, um, it's exited or terminated in the last seven days. So these numbers here, as you can see, they're always gonna be very low unless you do some mass exiting. Um, you're always gonna see very few numbers here because this just represents in the last seven days, this is the number of people that have exited. So let's pull this up here. So this person, Tess Stevens, um, terminated 825 of 2021. So something to keep in mind when you're looking at these is again, you don't have to take action on that. That may be perfectly acceptable. But if someone exited that you didn't want to, or um, if you're part of common measures, the system exits for you. So you may have provided a service. Let's pull up a common measures program. So test quickly. Let's say that you provided a service to this person last week and they exited because you forgot to enter that service. That may be an appropriate way to take action on this. Otherwise, it's, a, it's information for you to act on. So again, um, with exited and terminated widgets, um, the actual definition of what an exit means is written um, in the information guide and on the recording. Um, so you may want to take a look at those just so that you're sure um, you know like what it means to be exited and what that the date means because the dates are very important. So with with the common measures programs, it's going to actually tell you in the last seven days when the system created that exit, but again, it exits, if you're common measures, back 90 days. Um, not the case with BRN. BRN is more straightforward. You manual exit and you've exited that day. So just little differences there. So I think I'm gonna stop here.